Before we start today's episode, I want to give a quick shout out to Zencaster, which is a podcaster's best friend. Trust me when I tell you this, Zencaster is like the Shopify for podcasters. It's all you need to get up and running as a podcaster. And the best thing about Zencaster is that you get so much stuff for free. If you are planning to check out the platform, then please show your support for the Founder Thesis podcast by using this link, zen.ai slash founder thesis. That's zen.ai slash founder thesis. Hi, Rajiv Vij here from Cars on Rent India Private Limited. Ek minute, stop. Let's go. Let's go. Let's do this. This could be a great intro. Hi, I am Akshay. Hi, this is Saurabh. And you are listening to the Founder Thesis Podcast. We meet some of the most celebrated startup founders in the country. And we want to learn how to build a unicorn. Rajiv Vij grew up in a completely different India. After completing his MBA from FMS Delhi, he joined Hindustan Motors to sell their ambassador brand of cars, which used to be the top selling car in the country in that era. He then went on to head International Travel House, which was an ITC subsidiary providing a premium taxi service to ITC hotels and to their corporate clients. In the year 2000, Rajiv decided to quit his stable job to become an entrepreneur or a businessman as it would have been termed in that era. He decided to start a business in the space of mobility, named it Cars on Rent, and the rest as they say is history. Today Cars on Rent is one of the few profitable survivors after the taxi wars of the last decade, a war which was fought on the basis of investor money and left almost no survivors. Cars on Rent is now embarking on its most ambitious growth plan yet, one which involves moving to a pure electric vehicles fleet and using best in class technology to drive better outcomes for all stakeholders. Here's Rajiv telling Akshay Dutt about his roller coaster journey of two decades. I I studied in in Ramjas schools in in Delhi and then then I studied at Hindu College and then at FMS in in the Delhi University. Right. Worked for Mr. C K Birla. I I was I was selling the good old Ambassador car and and the trucks that that were manufactured by Hindustan Motors in their Uttarpara plant in Kolkata at that time it was still Calcutta and and after that i worked for 5 years with the, an itc company international travel so in uh, international travel house what were you selling like like was it like so so international travel house as you know is a corporate travel company and they also have tourism they have foreign exchange they also have a company which at that had the rights for europe car as a brand in india so it was all a part of my portfolio to to run uh, corporate travel foreign exchange inbound tourism outbound tourism and of course car rental and and i think car rental really caught me by 2000 i also realized that you know it is not giving me the satisfaction it's not giving me a sense of achievement that i would want to have on a daily basis and and so i decided to move without another job in hand like just decided oh no i had no job in hand and and you were married at that time like i was married i was married i had a i had a daughter and and i i know that when i decided to leave i i just came home one day and said that you know i have decided to leave and a friend of mine uh, when i told him that i am going to set up a company he said because nobody else made you the managing director so you will set up the own <laughs> but uh, you know uh, <laughs> that's okay and then you know we we still keep joking that you know maybe i i left my job only because of this but it has worked well okay okay so like you know i mean 2000 is an era where there was no appetite for risk in general in india and you know like like what what made you want to take on that risk to start a business and no fixed salary and you are married you have financial commitments so interestingly you know that's what that's what was probably my biggest strength my biggest strength was a very very firm belief in the potential of this industry and in the future of this industry in india and secondly my belief that you know i understand what requires to be done and i will be able to make a change 
as in you saw that existing players were not serving the need like like there was no player i mean you know what was the player i mean you know, even even in 2005 when i went to raise my first funding and most of the investors were actually cynical and they said no when you know, which industry are you talking about rajiv there is no player there is only this black and yellow meter taxi that you see that also are all 20 year old vehicles so which industry what scale which uh, exit what are you talking and and you know so i i started from there like like tell me about that launch like how, how did you actually because car rental is like upfront investment business right i mean you need to buy cars before you can rent them so how did you launch like did you have that corpus with you or so my total savings at that time were about 29 lakh and when i when i wanted to purchase my first set of cars i wanted to purchase about 30 cars to begin with and and you know i decided that we will set up an operation in delhi mumbai and and bangalore oh all three together okay all three together and we said that we'll start with about 10 cars each in in every city you know so we didn't have money we we had no no collaterals that we could give to a bank but i must say at that time there was this team of 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 young professionals at icici bank who were extremely supportive and and you know they were supportive because they knew what what i can probably uh, do in the long run and that you know i understand this industry that that i'll be able to do things our business plan was right with a capital equity of 29 lakh and zero business in hand we were able to go and get 30 cars funded which was roughly at that time about 1 and 1/2 crore of funding and and you know that somebody to put that confidence on me was uh, was a great sort of morale booster that you know we'll now make it and and you know after that of course you know simultaneously i then immediately went back to some folks at at hertz whom i knew and i told them that you know i have set up this company and i would like to to build your business in india so can we collaborate so their first reactions were uh, like you know our our franchisees in different countries are guys who run large hospitality chains they run airlines they have they have large uh, automotive businesses etc how will you do it and and i remember when i went to new jersey at that time to meet the chairman of the board of hertz this old very nice gentleman who was an ex ford person because ford used to own hertz at that time so he told me he said rajiv uh, where will you get the money from and i told him i said i'm sorry but you know if you are looking for somebody who has all the money there are many many people in india and i could put you through to a lot of them i am not claiming that i have money but i am telling you i know what requires to be done in this industry what can be achieved in this industry and i am putting my my career my personal uh, savings at stake and uh, you know 2000 also if you remember was a year when a lot of businesses were actually being built with somebody bringing in the domain knowledge and somebody else putting in the money so i i also told him i said you know that's that's how i look at this business so money will come from where it will come i said i don't know if you are asking me to tell you where the lock for this money is i don't know but if i do my business right money will come and and i think you know over the last 20 years, the entire team has focused on doing things right we have not we have not necessarily ran after every opportunity but we have also built the business in a manner that it is sustainable we have continued to innovate we have continued to stay in a startup mode for the last 20 years so at the end of the meeting he signed and i signed <laughs> and and we became the the master licensee for hertz in india in in the year 2001 we started representing and and guess what within a few months of of our starting 911 happened <laughs> so so like, like what what was your plan to get customers like who would rent these cars were you looking at hnis or corporates or like hotels so our focus in the beginning was completely corporates 
we went to some of the large corporates in each of these three cities and you know each of these cities have have large number of corporates some of them we had known from our our previous role some of the sales team members who joined they they had some connects but we went in the market and we said that you know this is what we are doing this is what we bring to the table and these are the slas and and service commitments that we make as a brand and i i must say the the customers were very supportive accenture was incidentally one of the customers who was who was the early approver and and said that okay go ahead and you know we'll give you business so we got some we got some marquee names on our on our customer list right in the beginning so that was that was again very very encouraging for the entire team why would a corporate not just do a taxi why would they do a rental car like oh. what was the the gap that this was filling as opposed to doing a taxi no so i don't know when you say taxi and when you say rental cab the difference is corporates always use rental cars as in you were providing a driver and car or oh yes everything was with driver i was it was not self drive i thought it's like the us model of this is a bit of confusion because you know we all like to call ourselves a car rental company in reality i don't know what we rent because what we rent is only a a service with a driver uh, the customer sits on the rear seat no he doesn't drive because hertz in the us is like self drive no that that model you are right i mean you know actually hertz doesn't even understand they didn't understand at least at that time as to what the business is in india and and you know they understood they learnt it over the years along with us the business in india has largely been a car with driver business the self drive business we we launched much much late because that market in india is is still developing so uh, essentially this was like a premium service for corporates like for like like a daily rent or a something like that like short term requirements this was a run service for corporates for their requirements for local airport transfers for local movement of their executives for intercity movement of their executives as also some long term requirement for their expatriates and their local guys who were who were wanting cars dedicated to them which they could use all the time so this was all of that uh, and uh, uh, then how how did uh, your business grow like these 30 cars were they like fully utilized uh, in in the first few months or like so very quickly we had to take a few cars from the market on a from other operators and you know run them in our fleet the business i mean you know while while as i mentioned 911 happened but our business kept on growing and i must say in the early days when we when we became a licensee for hertz it did open a lot of doors for us not that we got we got too much support in terms of uh, customer acquisition but you know a a global brand and hertz is a very powerful brand so we were able to to acquire some customers with that brand of course ultimately you know customers want uh service delivery they want pricing they want operational slas they want all of those things which which we which we deliver to them and and the business continued to grow so you told me 2005 is when you first went to raise money right like by 2005 what stage had you reached like how many how big was the fleet or what kind of revenues were you doing so as i said while initially we focused on the corporate corporate business but i was also very keen to build the business with the hotel industry so in 2003 when i looked at the market and i said you know how do we get into a hotel chain now as you know when i worked at travel house travel house is an itc owned company so all the itc hotels used travel house all the oberoi hotels used mercury and because that's the company that they own so the only company only hotel chain and there were really three hotel chains at that time the third one was the taj group large group but but very very challenging to get a large contract there because they had uh, different service providers in every city and i didn't want to do one hotel two hotels etc i wanted to grab the entire chain and you know that's the kind of partnership that i wanted to do it 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 was a a significant effort it took us over a year 
to crack it. And I, our pitch was very simple. I was telling them that, you know, as far as the guest is concerned, when he comes into a Taj property, whether that is in Delhi or Mumbai or Bangalore or Chennai or Timbuktu, he wants the Taj service. He doesn't care who you use for your, uh, your car rental services. He is not concerned. And at that point of time, in, in their different hotels, they had 23 different service providers. Mm-hmm. And each provider using different model. And... Yeah, I said his experience is a broken experience. And then, you know, Taj, there used to be this gentleman, Raymond Bixon, who was the managing director of Taj Hotels at that time. His family also incidentally owned some car rental business in the U.S. And I went and sold this whole story to him. And they were at that time trying to review all the services and they had appointed McKinsey to do a review of all the services. And so we, the next thing was that we had long meetings with these young consultants from from McKinsey who were doing their early projects in India. And, and, you know, they then went back and then I think presented it to them that yes, they need to move to to having a single service provider and and you know standardized services standardized uniform standardized cars standardized processes systems training etc cetera, etc cetera. and and we won that we won that contract of course we also got into uh, higher than jw marriott and renaissance etc uh, but by that time we had these two service lines in in 2005 and we were doing a business of Roughly about two, two and a half crores a month. Our our annual revenue was about a 25 crore revenue at, at that time. Hmm. And what was the fleet size? like? We had, we had a fleet of uh, 2005. We had a fleet of about six, 700, 700 cars. Yeah, about six, 700 cars. We grew very, very fast. I mean, you know, extremely fast. We grew at that point. From 30 to 700 is, yeah, very, very fast, yeah. So we, we grew to about that fleet. So that was the time that we went for our, our first first fundraise. Hmm. And what was the objective for the fundraise? Like, so, you know, my belief was that we will require uh, significant investments into physical infrastructure and into technology tools. And, and therefore, we wanted to, to go and raise some money. And Give me examples, like what, like physical infrastructure, you mean cars or like? No, 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 no. You see, this, this business, and, and you know, because I had before that, I had traveled across uh, North America and Europe and, and, and even in Asia Pacific region. I had seen how car rental locations are, what kind of setups they have. And in India, because you also have drivers, so you also have the additional requirement of training. Uh, You also have the additional requirement of restrooms for them. You have the requirement for their uniforms. So you needed all the infrastructure to make sure that you can deliver what you are committing to the customer. You needed to get drivers. You needed to train them. You needed to make sure that they they carry a uniform which is fresh, which is clean. You needed to make sure that when they are not working, they can rest at, at some place. You needed to make sure that you have a place where the cars can be washed, cleaned. You, you needed to make sure that routine repair, maintenance work can happen right in your workshop instead of the car going into, into an outside workshop and then getting stuck there. So you needed all that that set up in, in each of your, your locations. Plus, I, I also believed and, and, you know, while most people at that time were, were not using any technology tools, this industry was still working on long registers. I felt that, you know, uh, if I need to scale, which I, which I was committed to scaling, I was very clear that I need to, to have a, a robust technology tool. So, you know, back in 2000, 2005, I wanted to implement Oracle system into for our financial management. And, and you know, people were not even using tele at that time. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and the moment we raised money, that's the first thing that I did. I went to PwC and gave them the, the mandate to implement Oracle into our, our entire financial management system. And I think it's, it's worked very well for us. Nobody else has the, the access to data and information 
that we have and you know we had this even at that point of time that was the purpose of a fundraise at that time and i think financial management is a key lever in this business no because you are taking cars on like that installment or emi and then you have to therefore plan the inflow and outflow to meet the emis and uh, optimize the return on every car so akshay interestingly i'll tell you you are right and you know financial management is is very very critical because you know there is a car there is maintenance there is insurance there are taxes there are documents there are ownership issues there are all of those those things that that you need to manage uh, you need to manage the the uh, tenure for those cars you need to make sure that the emis are being paid on time that the documents are being managed well etc etc but also in 2005 itself or even even towards the end of 2004 i i had also come to another conclusion that long term it will be impossible to scale this business if i was to only continue to build this in an asset heavy model and so much before the the current generation of aggregators came into the market uh, i had i had floated a model back at that time which was called a uh, driver come owner model which was based on two fundamentals one was that the driver's earnings must be directly related to the revenue earned by a car which he drives and the cost of ownership of that car and the second is that that driver must have a long term interest in that asset yeah if these two principles are in place then you can keep on scaling otherwise you cannot mm, because now the interest of the driver is aligned with your interest he will make sure it is clean he will make sure it is well maintained because it's his own car absolutely absolutely so this was this was very very interesting and and you know at that time i had 800 drivers on my rolls and about 800 odd cars that we had and we we implemented this scheme each of those 800 drivers resigned from a permanent employment with the company because they knew that they would make more money and i was able to convince them that this money because it will be legitimately earned will help them improve their standard of living will help them improve their family will will help them do things which they otherwise will not do because you know if you are earning money illegitimately by stealing etc that's not going to help you reach too far because you will also use that money for gambling or whatever else that you do and and so you know it 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 worked very well over the years and and of course over over a later period as we got into more businesses which were asset heavy but this business we 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 started that model and and you know that has also helped us in in scaling up over the years so do you help the driver to get a loan do you give some advance towards the uh, upfront payment for it like how do you enable this so akshay you know we we have built an ecosystem because now we are we are in that mode we where where our business model is really mobility as a service model and you know that's what we do we have invested very heavily in technology over the year we have always had a large technology team we have implemented the ai and ml and and you know all those tools some time back and then you know automated all our processes we centralized our operation we set up a national command center in delhi we set up a shared service center in delhi so we did we did all of those things and and you know therefore what we do now and there are about 5000 drivers uh, vendor partners who are who are part of our system while the loan is taken by them the financial liability is theirs but what we do is two things one is we acquire customers and so we deliver them revenue we deliver them the revenue that they need to generate on that asset to remain profitable to make their money but besides that what we do is we have partnered with all the major oems so we help them get the cars at the best prices 
we get the best warranty terms from these OEMs. We also have partnered with financial institutions, banks, NBFC companies, fintech companies, etc. So we get them the funding for the cars at preferred prices, as processes. We also give our contract with them to the financial institution, which gives a comfort to the financial institution that, you know, their money is safe. Also, you know, in the B2B model, because we have control on all the cash flow. The money comes to us. The money doesn't go to the driver directly. And therefore, the financial institutions feel comfortable in, in funding them. But besides that, we have also partnered with, with the workshop aggregators. We have partnered with the uh, pre-owned car uh, companies, insurance companies. So, I mean, you know, so to manage the residual values, we, we manage, we, we help them through that entire ecosystem that we have built to support them because you see all said and done they are not rich guys they are they are investing money and that is a key part of our business it's a very very critical partnership that we have with these driver fleet partners fleet owners so so we have built this this support mechanism which which provides them support through the through the life cycle and and you know that relationship has worked well they have all also grown with the company so that has worked very well so from about 700 cars that you had in 2005 and you had now two verticals one was corporates one was second was hotel so tell me like you know what what were the next major milestones in the journey like so 2006 when we i mean you know 2005 and 2006 we raised two rounds of money first from sidby ventures then from sequoia westbridge uh, that's the time that we got into operating lease business how, how did you finally show investors the big picture? Because like you initially were telling me about those challenges of telling investors that like they did not see a business, like, you know, they did not see, they don't understand the space, so to say. So like, I, I think, I think, you know, because I, I understood this industry, how this industry has grown in other parts of the world, what, what has worked for this industry I had also studied a lot of the global brands in terms of looking at what worked for them, what didn't work for them, what kind of events took place when they saw high growth, what kind of events took place when they went down, and and you know, and and what are all kinds of products, services, customer relationships, what have they built? And and I think that that deep understanding, the the domain uh, expertise that that I brought to the table. I think it worked well and and of course the fact that I was I was putting my career and my personal savings at stake it, it convinced and and you know interestingly even in the first round by the time we were ready to decide as to who to take as an investor we were spoiled for choice we I mean you know we had three investors who wanted to put in money into the company and and you know we finally had to decide on one so that that worked in 2006 of course uh, you know sequoia westbridge who were together at that time they came and invested money and and in less than one year uh, of the of the earlier round which was in 2005 we were able to to raise money in the second round at almost two and a half times the money that we at the valuation that we raised in the first round but 2006 we after we raised the money we got into operating lease business. We also, because, so, you know, when I was at Travel House, I had actually brought a lease plan into India in a joint venture with Travel House. Now, what lease plan does is that in corporate, there is always an employee car policy. This is, of course, a very large business in, in US, Europe, and, and even in Asia Pacific region. In India, of course, this business has, has remained. But that business, you know, you can scale up to, to a huge level with very few people and, and which is which is everything is, is really outsourced in that sense. Uh, so we got into that business in, in 2006. If you like to hear stories of founders, then we have tons of great stories from entrepreneurs who have built billion dollar businesses. Just search for the Founder Thesis Podcast on any audio streaming app like Spotify, Ghana, Apple Podcasts and subscribe to the show. 
like essentially when a company gives a car to an employee then instead of buying that car they lease it from you and pay you a monthly lease price and and you take care of maintenance and uh, we take care of everything but not the fuel na no? fuel would be paid by the employee even fuel we would we would get him a fuel card and and you know even that we will take care not this so so we got into that then we got into radio taxi business in 2007 if you remember radio taxis came into india so we launched we launched easy cabs as as our radio taxi brand in 2007 and we got into delhi mumbai bangalore and hyderabad all four airports to to provide services to the to the air travelers at that time that was our first b2c play and, you know we we built that up then in 2008 Did you face challenges in going B two C? Because in B two B, it's easier to control many aspects of service quality, and the money is coming directly to you. In B two C, that's not the case, right? Like now, the they pay the driver directly, and no. So what we did again, I I decided to start with a model because you know by that time we had already uh, introduced the driver come owner model. so we created a driver come owner model in the radio taxi business with some modifications now what we did is that and and you know at the peak of that business we had almost 3 and 1/2 thousand cars we gave cars to drivers we bought the cars gave those cars to drivers and took money from drivers on a daily basis okay like a daily rent like a daily rent so you know if we had to take let's say 30000 rupees a month and hypothetically speaking so we would just take 1000 rupees a day and and you know then the rest is all his right then you don't need to so we remove this whole, uh, whole day. <laughs> because customers were going to pay him cash and i didn't want to get into trying to you know stop him from taking that cash etc that won't work even the olas and ubers have not been able to stop drivers from accepting cash so so we we did that in 2008 the airport refurbishment and some greenfield airports came in bangalore airport came in delhi came in bombay was refurbished hyderabad airport came in so we went and and set up our operations at the airport arrival terminals and then started servicing air travelers who were landing there from the arrival terminal and this was prepaid or like cash paid after the journey to the driver like so uh, so what what we do at the airport counters for the car rental is that you prepay based on where you want to go so and and you know we created some zones and said that you know for each of those zones this is the price Uh, so so that we did in 2008 we did another interesting stuff emirates was looking for a partner to service their first class and business class passengers like pick up drop pick up drop so we went and pitched to to emirates and again a, a long process of selection and and diligence and what not and what not but we built the the entire processes we showcased our capabilities to them and we got that contract in 2008 and and that resulted in in our launching uh, what we called a limo service in india so that was the first real limo service that we launched with a fleet of of a 100 mercedes cars in 2008 so we did that so you know those those 2 3 years after that we we did a lot of stuff and and you know the business kept on kept on growing 2008 otherwise of course because of the economic slowdown in 2008 it was otherwise uh, a difficult year for the economy but i think our business kept growing because we kept taking new initiatives all the time uh, so that that kept on happening 2011 we raised another round of investment from bts advisors which was a european boutique fund they invested into us 2000 and how much had the valuation increased by then like from compared to the last round oh again i think we i mean you know of course this was a long gap from 2006 to 2011 but i think our valuation went up maybe three three times more over that period so so yeah that that also happened 
and the fundraise for uh, was for what objective like what did you want to use the funds for this was now growth capital i mean you know we were wanting to grow to to add more fleets to build our our leasing business to build the taxi business to build the airport presence to build the limo business so we were we were doing all of that stuff and and you know so we raised money and how how big were you at that time like fleet size or revenue or so we had by that time reached revenues of about uh, 300 crores and 2011 12 yeah about 300 crores and we had we had a fleet in 2013 2000 yeah 2013 we had a fleet of about 8000 cars which of course was into leasing business into taxi business by that time we had also launched uh, self drive under miles brand so we we also did that but yeah the business business kept growing 2014 i, I took a a sort of strategic decision i said yeah you know now and at that time as i said we had almost 8000 cars uh, on our books and we had a debt of over 400 crores for the car purchase and i i was beginning to think that you know i need to now uh, move to becoming more a technology driven player than an asset driven player and so we did some some interesting things at that time in 2014 we we decided to exit from the leasing business so sumitomo corporation came and acquired that business from us so we we got a very good valuation for that business almost four times the the top line of, of that business we also decided to to you know because by that time the aggregators had already come in and they were they were offering taxi services at a very low price burning a lot of money subsidizing prices etc etc so we also decided that we'll figure out a way as to when we would exit from the taxi business because my belief was that you know for the next 10 years nobody in this industry will make money and then and, and then that i think is is now only just another one or two years we will reach 2024 but by the end of 2017 we also moved away from the taxi business we exited that business easy cabs business you exited and as far as the self drive business was concerned we separated that into a separate company which now is run as miles automotive technologies and my daughter sakshi she runs that company so so that we we made into a separate entity and this company we focused heavily on corporate business airport and airline and hotels business and some amount of government business very selectively that's what we that's what we started doing like, like more b2b focus entire b2b and and some amount of b2b to see because you know when you go to airports or you go to uh, even hotels because finally hotel is not your customer your customer is the end customer so but we we did that and so that also happened but but i think all good moves because what also happened is if you see this was a very timely move by us to move to an asset light business model so you know while moving from an asset heavy to an asset light model is always a very challenging thing because you need to take hard decisions sometimes you have to decide on what business to take what business not to take uh, sometimes the customers insist that you know you need to own the car but but again i think we are the only company in this space to have first of all tried because nobody else <laughs> even tries to do this kind of a thing and two to have have really successfully executed the plan over a two and a half year three years kind of period where we transitioned from an asset heavy business model 8000 cars 400 crores of debt to no cars and zero debt by 2017 you were zero debt by 2017 we were we were a zero debt company and and you know i i keep telling everybody that Uh, if you do this as a part of your strategy this is great but unfortunately if you see the pandemic is now forcing many players in this industry to take that route and and you know but that's the hard reality so 
So that will happen. And what was your turnover by 17-18? Like you were at 300 crore in 14. 17-18... Yeah, yeah, seventeen, eighteen. I mean, you know, because we were now not capturing the uh, the turnover for the for the cars, uh, so it was more like a, a hundred seventy, hundred eighty crores kind of turnover. Which is, but you know, you make more money here, and then you know you have you have less uh, hassles. You don't owe anything to anybody. And and your your return on equity is much much better. And so then from seventeen onward, like like what's the next major milestone? Like so you see after that, frankly, I have been looking at how to move to the electric vehicles fleet because if you remember, seventeen eighteen was the first time that India also started having some kind of an electric car. I won't call it a real car, but there was something which was called an electric car, but with very low battery range. You're talking about the Riva. Yeah, I'm talking about the Mahindra produced, like uh, including the Verito. The range was low. The performance was not good. The reliability was not good. Even Tagore, when the when the government went in for the tendering, Tata's also came out with Tagore. But again, same kind of problems, uh, technology outdated, etc. So all of that, all of that was there. I looked at at this industry, did very deep study over a period of time, tried to understand what are the key challenges, what all needs to be done, what is something that is required in the car, what we should really look at, what uh, kind of customers we can service, but for that, what kind of car, what kind of battery range, what kind of ecosystem, what kind of technologies would we require? So they did all of that. And and I think in the last year, year and a half, of course, as you know, some better cars have come. You now at least have 200 kilometers plus range cars available as, as basic sedans. You also have vans from, from MG and, and BYD now, which have a range of 300 to even 500 kilometers. You also, of course, have the luxury cars from, from Mercedes and BMW and Audi and Jaguar. So cars have, have now started coming in. The the second thing that has come is that the charging infra companies have also come in. Besides the global companies, there are also Indian companies which have which have come up. So they are also they are also building it up, and it is it is therefore now possible for us to service all kinds of requirements. It does not have to be restricted to only the employee transportation business, which is what was done by all these cars over the last few years. And so a few months back, we we decided that we will do it. And, and again, the, the approach is the same. My belief is that we should do it as a part of a strategy. We should lead this transition of, of the industry from the polluting IC diesel uh, engine uh, vehicles to the clean fuel, the, the cars which can save CO2 emissions. I'm sure some of the others will be forced by customers or by the market. And some will possibly be forced later through regulation. The industry will transition. There is no doubt. How soon it will transition will get decided over a period of time. But we clearly believe that we have an opportunity to lead this transition of this industry from the IC fleets to EV fleets. And we feel that this also is going to change the complexion of this industry from a fragmented uh, small operator, you know, the, the industry which has no entry barriers to an industry which will get more organized which will use more. What do you mean by fragmented small operator? Because you have Uber and Ola as like large fleets. So are, are, are you talking of that? So Uber and Ola, Uber and Ola have consolidated a lot of the B2C industry. I am now talking of the B2B industry. The B2B industry continues to be fragmented. And, and you know, there are still hundreds and thousands of players who are who are there. So the, the EV transition will change the complexion of this industry because you need a certain kind of technology. You need abilities to integrate your technology with the IOTs of the car. You need technologies to integrate with the charging infrastructure. You need technologies to track the battery range that is available in the car and what is the distance that the next duty is to cover before allocating that duty to a car. You also need to have scale 
to have access to dedicated charging infrastructure because this is not a fuel pump. You know, the fuel pump infrastructure got built over maybe a hundred years period. But for running your fleet, for running it efficiently, you need you need charging infrastructure access. And the prices here are not being defined by by anybody. They are dependent on who you are, how much fleet you have, what is your business model, and and you know how will you operate. So all of that is the is the driving force which will consolidate this industry. The public charging infrastructure today charges about twenty rupees a unit. But you can get significantly better prices because after all, the energy price is not 20 rupees a unit. There is infrastructure cost that people are investing on infrastructure. So, so I think uh, those things will happen. And, and, you know, our partnership, of course, with, with Fortum that, that we have announced today, this partnership brings in the, the muscle that we require in terms of financial strength. But also it brings in the knowledge and understanding of charging industry, the energy industry, because they have they have done it in, in the Nordic countries. They have done it in Europe. They understand this, this very, very well. And they have the ability to make the investments that are required to support our fleet. We believe that over the next five years period, we will induct a fleet of about 19,000 cars into Cars on Rent, which will be run under the plug brand. And, and you know, these cars in the fifth year, they will generate a revenue of about $350 million. And, and you know, there is money, there is more margin available because of the positive total cost of ownership of an EV. The customer is benefited in terms of cost. The the uh, fleet owner is benefited because there is more margin available. The fuel cost is lower. We can also have better margin on, on the same uh, vehicle. And, and therefore, you know, it, it works for everybody. And, you know, on top of that, over this five years period, as per our assessment, compared to running the same number of diesel cars, we would achieve a saving of about 4 lakh tons of CO2 emissions. And, and you know, that's what we are, we are really setting out to achieve. And, and you know, I have, I have no doubt that, that our team and, and, you know, our partners will, will support us that we build it up. So uh, I have a lot of questions to ask here. So first, let me start with why is the current B two B mobility service market so fragmented? Is it because margins are low? So you know it is mostly like mom and pop operators who are happy with that margin. Or see, actually, if you see any industry, Akshay, the industry gets consolidated if there are some entry barriers. If there are no entry barriers, anybody can buy one car and become a taxi operator, car rental operator. He will put Natha Singh car rental service and, you know, starts that. I mean, you know, that's that's fine. I, nothing wrong. Because that is the entrepreneurship that you have in our country, which is great. But, you know, the, the, the compliances, the drivers getting their wages right, <clears throat> the cars having all the documents right, they having the right insurance the taxes being paid, all those things are, are, are important. And, and, you know, when you don't have the, the industry with, with any kind of barriers, then you will continue to have more and more and more and more players, which is, which is of course, one way that the industry operates. And so tell me about this partnership with Fortum, like uh, what is Fortum's background and so fourth fortum is is as you know a, a nordic company and and you know they are the they are one of the largest european player in the energy business they have they have annual revenues of almost 65 billion uh, euros and and you know in india also they have they are like a transmission and distribution company no they are a, they are actually an energy company which is into all kinds of energies the solar energy the hydro energy they they like shell and yes yes so and and you know the charging infrastructure of course is is one part of their business which which they have been building all in india also i think they have already uh, set up about 100 114 or or some charge stations already as part of this partnership uh, to support our fleet of, of 19,000 cars in 79 cities across India, 
they will set up about 3200 charge points these 3200 charge points will actually have an energy you know in in terms of how much energy they can they can deliver of of roughly 100000 kilowatt of energy is what these 3200 charge points will be able to deliver at any point of time so so that's that's what this this partnership is we of course are are committing to them that we will have these cars so that will help them achieve a certain utilization of this infrastructure that will also make sure uh, that you know they the investment that they are making they'll be able, able to make a reasonable return on that investment over the next 5 years time so so that's the part okay okay and these are like dedicated for cars on rent slash plug or like they're like public infrastructure which so you see the charge points will be installed for us but we are not going to be able to use them 24 hours a day because our cars will be working our cars cannot be charging all the time <laughs> therefore when these are not being used by my fleet then instead of keeping them idle we will also make them available to the to the third party fleets public everybody uh, they can charge okay okay so they will build it and you will operate this this charging infrastructure they will run they will operate they will build they will invest they will do everything my business model will remain the asset light model also you know the the charging industry will evolve there is a lot that is going to happen in this industry but this is their business they will be able to to manage those changes ultra fast chargers will come there will be more energy there will be more battery chemistries that will come so they will be able to do those things and bring the best technologies that we require to to support our fleets right 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 you have a specialist who's taking care of charging right and you can focus on mobility and the 19000 cars will continue to be in the asset light model like the driver will so we've had we've had great discussions with with the uh, banks and financial institutions and they are all happy to 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 fund the cars because you know as as i mentioned the business is is being given by us there is existing business our existing customers actually spend about 1500 crores annually on transportation so we are first of all just targeting to increase our wallet from these customers because you know they should spend more and more on on cars on rent uh, ev fleet than anything else and then of course you know new customers etc that that we are acquiring not only in corporate and hospitality airline airport government psus smes so that's that's how we are we are going to be building it up like obviously customer acquisition is not a challenge for you because you already have those relationships in place to like get them to convert to ev but, but what is the benefit for a customer in terms of is there a commercial benefit also like is it cheaper so the proposition to the customer is simple you know when the evs of course started in india the the players who offered an ev even for employee transportation they asked for a premium pricing we are instead saying that number one you don't have to pay anything more so there is no extra cost to begin with number two when you take my basic package because the car the initial capital cost is higher so the basic package price is same as the ic car but on the extra kilometers when you run because extra kilometer my charge rate let's say on the ic car my charge rate was for a basic sedan a 15 rupees a kilometer on this car because there are only two components for the extra rate the extra rate is the fuel cost and the maintenance cost and the time now fuel cost in the other case is maybe eight rupees a kilometer in this case the fuel cost is maybe one and a half rupees a kilometer <laughs> and, and therefore you know i can probably reduce that to one third or maybe even lesser so that's one the second is that you know in the last one one and a half year the fuel prices have been going up the energy prices hopefully will be more stable and because of the fuel prices going up the customers have been incurring more cost they have been paying more as a fuel price impact they have been paying me a surcharge so that will not be there so that will be a saving and then on every invoice i certify the invoice that on this journey when you travel on an ev you have saved x number of co2 emissions is that monetizable 
CO2, like carbon credits? So as of now in India, as of now in India, it has not, it has not been structured. But I think there is an energy exchange that has come in. Carbon credits is something on which the government is, is working on. Very soon, hopefully, they will become monetizable. And, and, you know, we will, of course, provide also a proper certificate to, to every one of our customers on the CO2 savings that they make. So, you know, they can, they can achieve their ESG targets. They can achieve their net zero targets. They can achieve all of that. That is a major, yeah, a major upside to doing this, because I think ESG is like a big trend in the investing, like investing debt, like like you get debt at lower prices if you are ESG friendly, and you get uh, more investor interest if you are ESG friendly. And so, what is now? What is current status? Like, what is your fleet size today? Like of plug. To so plug, we are we are just we have started. We we have started doing a few pilots. The cars, as as uh, I mentioned, over the next about fifteen months between now and end of March twenty three, we will build a fleet of about two thousand electric vehicles, and and you know then over the next four years we will build it to to nineteen thousand cars. We are. We are we are right now placing some orders on on the OEMs. We are getting the so which cars have you identified? Like what are there are only three manufacturers right now that we are looking at, and and you know there is a basic sedan which comes from Tata Motors, and there are the vans which come from MG and the BYD. These are the only three that that you want to start immediately we will get into luxury cars but a little bit later we want to wait for what happens on this tesla you know the duties etc etc and what kind of pricing it comes in because that may be another another opportunity that we'll we'll look at but then i think there are more manufacturers who will bring in more car models what is the range currently that these cars get? Like 200? About 200 kilometers plus on the ground range is available. MG car gives about 300 kilometers on the ground. And this uh, BYD, the E6 car, this gives you a range of almost 500 kilometers. Okay. BYD is also like they, they are building in India like these EVs. They are assembling. I mean, you know, everybody is only assembling. assembling. Okay. What is the role of technology in building this EV fleet? Like tell me about some of the interesting things that technology is enabling so as I said, you see, what is important in this is one, that you need to always get the health of the car. And for that, an integration with the IOTs of the car is very critical. Your technology tools have to be capable of doing that. And, you know, we have proprietary uh, technologies of our own. So we have done that integration with these car models. Downtime can be reduced using technology because you can predict when maintenance is needed. Not only downtime, you you actually know what is the situation of the car battery, how is the battery management system working, what kind of range is available, what kind of preventive maintenance, if any, is required, what needs to be checked. Everything you can get, huge volume of data that you can get. Even the how the car is being driven, all of that you, you get to know. The second, which is important, is that you are also able to integrate with the entire charging network because access to that network, making bookings for, for when you want to get energy in your in your car, which is the nearest location, the navigation to, to that, all of that is the second part. The third part, as I said, is, is this whole issue of to decide which car to get which duty depending on what battery range is available R rostering and allocation the rostering is is something which is which is the third part mm -hmm. which is i think a very complex complex algorithm the fourth of course is the the asset security so we have also built a capability in terms of uh, tracking, geofencing, remote immobilizing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, of the car, so that you know there is there is also asset security that is there, and it is also an issue of customer security because customer safety security is also driven through that. At the back end, we have built systems which are based on an an exception based alert system which are proactive alerts that, that take place so that we make sure that there is complete reliability, tracking, safety, security, etc. Of, of all kinds of customers. So that's, that's 
those are important basically all the inefficiencies which drive up cost of mobility can be eliminated uh, through this uh, by using these smart i would say many of them but but i wouldn't say that that's the end we will continue to upgrade and we'll continue to use more and more technology to to upgrade and and you know keep improving uh, customer experience and keep improving the the operational efficiencies into the system you know most of the founders which i interview tend to be on like tech side you know where they have a product and they're purely like building products uh, online products in your case you're running a very operations heavy business uh, what are the ways to run this efficiently like you know uh, in the initial days for example did you like travel to all the cities like you launched in three cities were you like on the ground a lot to make sure things are managing or how do you make sure that things are being run well and how has that evolved over the years i think 20 years back you are right that it was a a operation heavy manual operations kind of business that's when when i started but today our business is as tech heavy as any tech company after all you know when whether you look at uh, any of the delivery companies yes they have they have technology for the customer to place their order they have technology for the delivery boy to get that order for the restaurant to to get the order to prepare but then somebody will have to pick it up and go and deliver <laughs> and, and so you know everything else is is going to be you know somebody the food is not going to fly and reach your house through this this box that we are both talking from so i think similarly as far as as far as today's business is concerned our business is completely a technology business yes i still as i said i call myself a, a servicing company and not a technology company but we as as a as a mobility as a service provider what do i own i own technology i own customers i don't own assets so that final delivery of the service is done by somebody else i make sure that he is doing it right i make sure that the car is clean that the driver is right that the driver is is duly checked that the driver will remain in a certain geofenced area that the transaction is is being tracked that the customer is getting the right experience that he should get but all of that happens from my national command center i don't i have no people sitting on the ground who are doing all of this nothing like when did you eliminate people on ground like and have you replaced it with like video feed or like you know like you said that the car is clean there are no no so there are the technology is now capable of checking a whole lot of things because you know we implemented the the ai tools in, into the system so a lot of the the quality control issues got transferred a couple of years back to the national command center like like to the national command center and and actually i mean at the national command center also nothing happens because the system itself it looks at some pictures which are uploaded and based on those pictures it it decides whether a duty can be given to this car or it cannot be given to this car documents are uploaded the system reads those documents and it knows whether there is a fraud document or everything is is uh, is fake or it is correct so you know we have we have done those things a couple of years back and and you know because all these tools we have built in house so there is also a lot of domain knowledge that that we have within the organization where where people are are doing this stuff so like driver uh, takes photo of the car before he gets duty and then those photos if the system approves only then the driver gets rostered otherwise he doesn't get rostered that day and maybe he takes a photo of himself so that he's in in uniform you check that and you know the the system is capable of checking whether this photo when has this been taken is it a current photo is it a past photo has this photo been repeated so the system does all of that manually it is not even possible it's impossible and it's very very time consuming and and you know in our in our business you cannot supervise a driver on the road yeah. there is no way and how do you do the driver training like you know because in b2b that service element is important so now there are there are online training programs which are available on their phones 
they have to go through that and there are some online tests that are done based on which we know what what they are doing or not doing if there is a negative feedback about a driver he goes through a refresher program so currently what is your uh, breakup of business like how much business comes from say like this uh, pick up drop of call center kind of a setting or how much comes from very very little very very little i mean you know our our majority of business is business travel where the company executives are traveling uh, locally or outstation so w- w- why is that like the the call center business is low margin is it like you know if you look at the call center or or this it its companies employee transportation business or crew transportation business with the ic fleets my view has been that this business does not give you enough margin the it is difficult to manage the the customer satisfaction and therefore you neither make profit nor you build a brand and so we have we have been very very selective on on that we have stayed away from from building expanding that part of the business but i think when we look at the evs there is a whole different game that the evs will have and and you know we we are creating some models where the the customer satisfaction as also the margins will be better significant do you have uh, competitors in this space of like organized competitors like one is of course they are like small and organized players but who are the no no there are large there are large players including the oryx avis travel house etc they are all there and any of them getting into the ev space like you are not to my knowledge as yet but i am sure they will sooner or later they will and and i hope they do are you planning fundraise like uh, in the immediate future in the ev business we will we will raise uh, funding because we intend to make more investments into technology we intend to make more investments into into expanding our network also into bringing more customer acquisitions etc so we will we will raise some amount of funding so uh, my last question for you so you know where do you see yourself say by 2030 playing golf <laughs> <laughs> i've been waiting to go and play golf <laughs> if you like the founder thesis podcast then do check out our other shows on subjects like marketing technology career advice books and drama visit the podium.in that is t h e p o d i u m . i n for a complete list of all our shows before we end the episode i want to share a bit about my journey as a podcaster i started podcasting in 2020 and in the last 2 years i've had the opportunity to interview more than 250 founders who are shaping india's future across sectors If you also want to speak to the best minds in your field and build an enviable network then you must consider becoming a podcaster. And the first step to becoming a podcaster starts with Zencaster which takes care of all the nuts and bolts of podcasting from remote recording to editing to distribution and finally monetization. If you are planning to check out the platform then please show your support for the Founder Thesis podcast by using this link. zen.ai slash founder thesis. That's zen.ai slash founder thesis.